thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, I'm Yura, I work at Slido. Um, and we have Gib with us, which I'll we'll introduce in just a moment. But while also you're getting settled, a um, few tips that were mentioned before, but for those who are joining now, uh, probably the best experience in this um, Zoom Slido webinar is going to be if you go full screen, so you can double tap on the, on the video to enter your full screen mode, and you'll still have the Q&M polling panel right there for you. There'll be a lot of polls that get implemented in, into this talk, so it's going to be really interactive. And uh, make sure you ask questions. So um, in the Q&A panel on your right-hand side, you can type questions also anonymously, and then make sure you also upload them um, so we can sort of answer the most burning questions uh, at the end. And um, Gib, just to quickly introduce you to everyone, although many people might be familiar. So Gib was the VP of product at Netflix, like in starting in 2005. And then from 2010, he became the CPO at Czech, a textbook rental company. Uh, but from what I've known you for, you're, you're really a teacher. So uh, you also get lectured at Stanford, INSEAD, and you give a lot of product talks around the world, both in person and I guess with these stems uh, online. And that's what we are going to talk about here today. So Gib yeah. has been doing a lot of interactive webinars and this is going to be an example how, especially if you also find yourself in the situation where you have to deliver the same presentation or meeting like this via Zoom um, and you want to have some tips on how to make it more engaging, that's what we're here for. Good. Okay, it's supposed to feel like in person, so let's go for it. So this talk, I, I, I call it how to, how to give a rock star webinar. I'll give you a little bit more sense about um, why I call it that. Um, but the, the, the reason that we're here today, obviously lots going on. Um, all of our lives have been turned upside down and we're all online. So, uh, and if you're a speaker like me, there's, there's been folks that were doing in-person events and now we're all trying to figure out how to do it online. And we, we want to engage and inspire audiences despite a number of substantial challenges. So the first is often the technology is flaking. Um, and here I'm using this crazy combination. Of, I'm, I'm hoping my home internet will work, uh, Zoom will work, Slido will work, uh, and then Google Slides. And it's really hard to read your audience. So I, I can't see you. Um, so usually in an in-person audience, you get a much better sense of what's going on. And then everyone is distracted. So uh, some of you, uh, you know, you're probably streaming Netflix on the side, okay? Um, and so it's really hard to engage audience. It's hard to read them. So I just want to start with a pop quiz, mainly just to, to make sure that Slido is working and that everyone's set up. Uh, it's a fun question. So, you know, it's a very simple question, which is, do I have your undivided attention? That's really all I'd like to know. And, and this is like a test for honesty. <laughs> I, you know, I don't know if I can believe it or not, but, but um, it's, it's just helpful. And, and actually the response I'm getting is pretty typical, which is about two thirds of the folks are, are nicely saying yes. And a third are, are nicely acknowledging that they're doing email on the side or they're texting or whatever else. And, and that is one of the challenges of going online into these virtual experiences. So I'm going to talk about some, some tactics to, to sort of fight your way through that. So the reason I call this how to give a rock star webinar, I was driving along in my car and a song uh, and it popped up on the radio. I was looking for sort of inspiration on how to talk about all this stuff. And, and the song popped up. So I was born in 1962. I know who the Beatles are. Um, and I know some of you may not, but the Beatles, they, they were not an overnight success. They actually started in 1957. And in the beginning, they were just kind of working it out. They were in Hamburg, Germany. They were working how to engage the audience. They were doing call and response. You notice here, it's not a very big crowd. Like there's enough room to dance. Um, and then after about six years of this hacking, if you will, um, it, through lots of sort of discipline and structure to their storytelling, to their lyrics, to very structured musical competition, composition, they I mean, finally hit it big. This is 1963, 64 it, on the Ed Sullivan Show in the United States. This was after six or seven years of hacking. And then in fact, this is them playing at Shea Stadium at the time, the world's biggest concert. It's probably among one of the biggest. And here you can see the level of engagement that they were able to, to get to inspire in the audience. They inspired Beatlemania. And then as a business success, they sold 600 million albums, 8 billion in revenue. They had 72 top 100 hits. They had 17 at the same time. 
and they had 22 number one hits. So no one has come near to them. The, the next recording artist is, is a third less than, than their revenues. And then they kept going with this invention and reinvention all the way until 1970 when they broke up. And then at that point, each of the artists went on to become a, a highly successful individual artist. So a very long and very successful creative era for them. So my background, your eye already gave it to me, gave it to you. Early I was at Electronic Arts building bang bang shoot 'em up games and then I did kids software companies. Uh, I was at Netflix and then my last startup is called Chegg, which is a textbook rental and homework help company. And then for the past bunch of years, I've been doing talks, workshops, writing, uh, and then I do it some, a little bit of it within academics at Stanford and in Seattle and Europe. It's all good. All right, so Rockstar webinars. I've got three sort of chapters to this, if you will. So the first, I wanna talk about the structure of these. And second, I wanna talk about engagement tactics. And then the third, this concept of high cadence creativity. But then I wanna step out and then instead of talking about this, I wanna show you something. So what I'm going to do is a case, and it's a Netflix case, it's a current case, it's a today case. And the question is, should Netflix enable custom playback speed? Should they give users the ability to choose what speed? So here's Bruce Springsteen, you can watch him uh, on Netflix, he's a, he's a literal rock star. But the question is, should you give Netflix members the ability to slow it down or speed it up? That's the case I'm going to do at the end with you. All right, and, and this technology is magic, okay? It, 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 it speeds up, it won't make people talk in high pitched paces, and it doesn't screw up the lip sync, and it makes the action adventure bomb scenes bigger, et cetera. And without any data or any in, information, I call this provisional dis, decision making, just on your intuition or instinct, I'm really trying to read the room right now to discover whether you think this is a good idea or a bad idea. And the simple question is, should Netflix launch custom playback speed? And I, I'm just reading the room right now. I wanna know what you guys think. Is this a good idea or a bad idea? And what I see is you guys are leaning back, right? Just a little bit more of you think it's a bad idea. And I, at the moment, I can only guess why you think it's a bad idea, but I have some intuition. But I wanna remember this, because I wanna see if people change their mind when we get to the case at the end. Okay, 55% no, 45% yes. They're leaning back, your eye, correct? Remember that data for me. All right, <laughs> so now I'm into my first chapter. I wanna talk about structure. And, and the structure of these things is very disciplined, like the Beatles lyrics. For everything I do, there are three chapters, just like a Beatles song. And if you listen to a Beatles song, it starts with an intro, and then there's lyric one, lyric two, lyric three. There's actually a little intermission in the middle. And then in the music world, they call it a coda. But for what I do, it's a conclusion. So that structure helps people follow the story, helps them understand where they are. It helps them to understand when they're getting close to the end, which for many presentations is a moment of relief. But if you look at everything I do, it follows the structure. And the second is, I call it the rule of threes, and, and rules are made to be broken. You'll see I break them all the time. But in the structure, I, I, you'll notice this repeating three thing. Humans, it's hard to remember more than three things. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm almost gonna be 58. It's even harder for me than the rest of you. Three things makes it easy to remember. And you'll notice that um, the structure of three chapters provides sort of a guidepost along the way to understand where you are in this journey. And then I sort of joke that the earlier a person is in their career, the more text they put on screen. And if you adhere to this rule of three, notice I only use three bullets. It, the, the discipline is it forces you to, to remove text because text is boring, it's hard to read. And for me, I just use it as a reminder of what I wanna talk about. So that's the rule of threes. So storytelling structure, there is a structure that exists since 800 BC. So I've taken one image from the Odyssey by Homer, that's from 800 BC. Um, this is Odysseus, but the structure, and you'll notice in anything you watch, it's always the same. There's a problem, there's a solution to that, and then with that solution, with those learnings, you can apply it to make your life better. So in the story of Odysseus, he had a 10-year journey trying to get home to his wife, Penelope, 
a, a series of these problem solution, how, how your life get better. In this case, uh, all of the ships had failed in passing the sirens. The sirens would sing this enchanting song and drive these men crazy. So in this case, all of the rowers have covered their ears. They can't hear the sirens singing. And Odysseus had himself tied to the mast so he couldn't do anything because he wanted to hear it. But, and, and this is, what was the problem, the sirens? What was the solutions? Don't listen to it. And really, uh, this is a metaphor on how to live a distraction-free life. And this is what he eventually was able to do. Get, he got home to his wife or another, no one else did. There was a happy ending. So if you think about my structure today, I, I start with a the problem. There, there are distracted, hard to read audiences. And then I have solution, structure, engagement tactics, and high cadence creative. And then the, how can your life be better? You'll notice I, I am a feedback freak, but I have a net promoter score for every talk I've ever done. And these tactics have helped me to improve engagement, which is really the name of the game in getting high NPS talks. And then there's some urgency. I want you to engage in these tactics tomorrow for everything that you do. So I'm kind of going meta on you to share how I think about these issues. All right, engagement. How do you inspire Beatlemania, okay, if you will? It would be interesting to see how, you know, if the Beatles could do it in a webinar. Um, so a, a few tactics for you. The first thing is I always start backwards. So what I think about is at the end of a talk, what are the key ideas that I want to land? And then it really comes out of something else, which is, what am I passionate about? And if you can't tell, I'm passionate about teaching. And then you have to have a set of ideas that are important to a broad audience, okay? Because um, if only three people are interested, you probably, you know, it, it's not gonna be that much fun because you won't have an audience. And then the next thing is, what can you credibly deliver? Uh, and, and that's an important thing. And I'll give you an example in a minute of that. And then at the end of the day, we're all full of stories. Storytelling is what drives ideas along and you just gotta be you at your authentic self. So the, the dude here, this is Mark Randolph. He was a co-founder of Netflix. He just released a book this year and he was at Netflix. He was the startup CEO. He was there about the five years. And this book, it just tells his story, his journey, the good and the bad. And it's called, That Will Never Work. And that is exactly what his wife would say to him every morning to every idea he ever had. And it's this wonderful, authentic and personal journey that, that, that he can credibly deliver. And this is about the life of an idea, about how ideas can turn into startups, which is a wonderfully broad idea. So this is just an example how to think about this. All right, so for me as a teacher, one of the most effective things I've learned is to, to create these tools, the models, and frameworks that I hand over to my audience. And I just wanna share with you some of my tactics around making that happen. I call it the dad model. You know, I'm, I'm the awkward 57-year-old dad of a 22 and 24-year-old daughter, uh, but here's the model. I start with a very detailed example from my life. And then I abstract it into a tool or a model or a framework. And then what I'm hoping is to hand over this model in such a way that the audience can apply it to their lives. So I'm gonna give you an example right now of how I do this. This is Dan Rosenzweig. He is the, the CEO of Chegg, that textbook rental startup. And I joined there in 2010. I, I was the head of product, the chief product officer. And he was at one end of the hall. And Dan's like, grow, baby, grow. Like the, the job of a startup is to get big and we're gonna grow, 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 grow. At the other end of the hall was the CFO, the chief financial officer. This is Greg. And Greg was actually saying a very different message, which is we need to slow down in order to figure out how we're gonna build this into a business with profits that we can monetize. Like, huh. So one end, grow, baby, grow. The other one, slow, baby, slow. Like, think about it. You're the product leader. You're stuck. What do you do? You know, it's, it's a, it was a horrible situation for me. And what I did is I got the two of them together in a room and I, I asked them a simple thing. How would you prioritize growth, engagement, that's really product quality, how good is your product, and monetization? Do you have a business model that works? And Dan said, I put growth first, engagement second, and monetization third. And Greg said, I put monetization first, engagement second, and growth third. And, and the only good news is they put engagement or product quality in the middle at the same, right? Like, oh crap. So, you know, at this point I said, okay, it's time for a cage match, right? 
I, I'm going to go away and I'm going to come back in a bit. And then I just want one answer because this, these, you are not aligned and you're tearing the whole company in half. And so uh, two hours later, if you know Dan, you know, the answer, there's no right answer or no wrong answer, but Dan had prevailed. And he said, okay, we're going to go growth first, engagement second, and monetization third. And Greg agreed. So you can think about your company today. You know, is everyone aligned? If, if you asked everybody in the company how to prioritize these three forces, would they give the same answer? Anyway, what I've been trying to do is, is illustrate how I use the, the dad model to, to land tools, models, and frameworks. All right, engagement tactics. So engagement, that's really the name of the game for delivering high quality talks, okay? So that's a happy, I think that's in uh, Amsterdam at Tom, Tom, Tom. Storytelling, stories propel ideas. And what's great about them is they provoke emotion. And if you provoke emotion, you make ideas memorable. And that's why storytelling is so important. Blah! Okay, so like I, I will often, you know, and I apologize for that. I'll often do things to provoke emotion. So you're gonna remember me. You're gonna remember me probably as the crazy guy kid. Okay, but that's what emotion does for you. I do lots of cases in polling. You've seen examples and, and it's easy to do in an online context. So here's a little case. Uh, I'm assuming, I'm hoping all of you are Netflix members. I'm hoping and assuming that you all pay. And it, by the way, it's okay to share accounts. Netflix really doesn't mind. But you'll notice there's a lot of content from African-American comedians. There's a great series called Dear White People. And, and the N-word is used throughout. And it's a Monday morning, and this is the head of communications, the chief communications officer at Netflix, in a meeting. He's, he's a 57-year-old white male like me. In a meeting, he actually used the, the real N-word. And part of that team staff was really uncomfortable, rightly so, and went to Reed Hastings, the CEO, and said, hey, Reed, this happened. And now imagine you're the CEO, right? So Reed's thinking about it. He's got three choices. He could do nothing. That's probably not going to be good. He can reprimand or he can fire the person. And in this case, he thought about it. He brought him in. I mean, there's really, you know, I, I think it was a mistake. Uh, but there are some folks that don't understand. There's no context that 57-year-old white males can say this. You can't, you can't even read it in a script. Okay? Um, and the N-word exists as a solution so we can reference the, the idea uh, with all of its horrible baggage. However, uh, what Reed chose to do, he did a reprimand. However, a month later, he used the word again. And the thinking was that the head of communications should, should understand that you can't use this word and made the mistake twice. So Reed chose to let the person go and very publicly. You know, and what Reed said was sometimes being a better leader is about just being a better human. And, and he made this story public. You know, he helped lots of people understand that you can never say the word and it's okay to refer to N-word. Anyways, I'm trying to give you a sense about how cases and story can drive ideas to engage your audience. All right, so this is a really simple one. Um, the, the Beatles, you know, they really had 13 years of high cadence creative work. So I just want to share a little model that, that, that I've been thinking about really for the last five years. Creative work requires these four things. And you'll notice I made it spell turf, okay? That I was hoping that you would remember it because it spelled something. And what I mean by each of these forces is that uh, time, with time, you get to explore a range of ideas and connections between them. And then urgency, if you have unlimited time, there's nothing really kicking your butt to make you deliver. So for instance, in the last month or two, th this whole online shift has been kicking my butt to, to figure out solutions to how to do webinars. And then you need repetition. So I have 350 net, uh, net Promoter Score results for 350 talks in the last really four years. Lots of experimentation and experimentation and hacking leads to improvement. And then the, the, the last idea is you need focus. You need the focus in specific areas that are, that that you're expert in to reveal the depth of thinking. So in my life, I've had four years doing talks, workshops, writing, webinars. The urgency in the last month has been, how do you get everything online? 
And then for me, the repetition is about getting this objective measure net, net promoter score. I'll, I'll share with you my NPS for this talk at the end. And then my focus is really on three areas, leadership, and that's inspired communication of a vision. And really this talk is about communication, about product strategy, and then I call it career hacking. These are the three things that I tend to focus on. All right, so I promised you a case where instead of telling you all this stuff, I'm gonna show you, okay? So, and I know you guys were all leaning against this from the beginning, but so, so I wanna just sort of try to tease out the issues. In this case is should Netflix enable custom playback speed? So, a little context. So if you worked at Netflix, you would understand this. The product leader's job is to delight customers in hard to copy margin enhancing ways. And margin enhancing is just a fancy way of saying, build a business, okay? And I can't, I didn't, I can't make it spell anything. This is a DHM model. But I just wanna share a little bit more, more about the model so you can think like Netflix people think about product. So Delight, I, I'm hoping that, you know, if, if I asked you what delights you today about Netflix, you're probably going to have ideas that, that are hiding in, in all of these ideas here. And, it, you know, it takes a lot of experimentation to figure out what resonates with customers or not. But this is largely the list today. And then margin enhancing, you know, building a business, Netflix started as an a la carte business. You, you would rent one DVD at a time. It actually started as a DVD by mail business. We didn't launch streaming until 2007, January. But the big insight is you get everything you want for you know, about 15 bucks a month. That's all you can eat subscription. But in the early days, we had no idea how to make money. So lots of price and plan tests. You know, should a person get two DVDs at a time, three DVDs at a time? And most of you will notice that your price keeps going up a little bit as a result of price testing. In the old days, we, we were selling used DVDs. We actually did big, big ass ad banners on our site as a way of making money. We just didn't know how to make money. So I just wanna give you a sense of what's really driving one of the most substantial margin enhancement tactics today. It's the idea that you can right size your original content investment. So Netflix knows the member taste of 175 million members today. It's really extraordinary. And they predicted that 100 million people would watch Stranger Things. And because of that, they were comfortable making a $500 million investment. And then now I'm gonna reveal my movie taste. Yeah, Stranger Things is good, but um, I'm a little freakish. So I love BoJack Horseman. And the prediction was that 20 million people would enjoy Bo BoJack Horseman. Because of that, they were comfortable making a $100 million investment in BoJack. So this is the concept of right-sizing your content investment. And this is one of the ways that, that Netflix is learning to make money. It's a huge advantage over some other companies out there. So here's the tricky one. What makes Netflix hard to copy? And that's what I want you thinking about right now. And I'll, I'll be asking you, you know, your answer. So just take you way back. This is like 2004. This is when Netflix was a DVD by mail company. H.B. Mox, a product manager, he came to me. He was so excited because in an A-B test, he had discovered that this new homepage did a better job of bringing customers into the site. They would click on the red start now button more than that past page. I'm like, cool, uh, HB, you've delighted folks and, and, and you're probably building a better business, margin enhancement, but this is not hard to copy. You know, I will bet my paycheck that within a month, Blockbuster, those bastards from Blockbuster will copy exactly your work. So here you can see Blockbuster had exactly the same thing. They've got the happy family on the couch. And this just illustrates why doing hard to copy work is so important. So what I'd like you to think about right now is what are the words, and bonus points if you can put one word, but what are the words? What are the things, if I gave you 500 million bucks to compete with dear Netflix, to create a startup to compete with them, what are all the things that you would find hard to execute? What are the things about Netflix that are wicked hard to copy? Uh, if you know me, I'm from Boston and, and wicked is a, is a Boston word. Um, you could probably count the number of times I used that word. Okay, I'm seeing a ton of content. I love the Netflix and chill. Uh, that's connected to another issue that I can't quite see yet. What are you seeing, your eye? What do you see, what do you see? 
I'm seeing, starting to see brand, a lot of content obviously there. Is this normally the response that you're seeing or is this audience giving a different stuff? Uh, this is my best audience yet, yeah, Uri. Nice. These are the best answers I've ever gotten. <laughs> I love, so I see content, I see brand. What else is sticking out? There's algorithm coming up. Algorithm's nice. Netflix originals, that is content. Originals, originals, original content. Okay, got, got it, got it, got it, got it. Okay, I'm seeing a lot of algorithms, which I really love. Um, I'm only fishing for, oh, okay, I saw a word in there, which was network, okay? Uh, I'm fishing for ideas. I see scale, I see global. Uh, integration with TV sets, that, 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 there's an idea hiding in there. Uh, okay, this is great. A great range of ideas where you're thinking about what, what, what data, 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 I love it, I love it. Um, okay, so I'm gonna share most of the ideas that I search, search for. Oh, personalization, I love it. Unique technology, I love it, I love it, I love it. Okay, I love the Netflix and chill. I'm gonna associate that with the idea of brand, okay? By the way, that was not purposeful. <laughs> That just happened. Like when the dude showed up with the red Netflix t-shirt and the bag of ice at Halloween, I had to go look up what the hell Netflix and chill meant. Okay. Okay. So here we go. Most of the ideas are in these four buckets, brand, network effects, unique technology, and economies of scale. So I'm just going to share a little bit. Original content, I'm starting at the bottom, is about economy of scale. Today, Netflix has 175 million. They can make a $20 billion investment in content where poor Amazon, I love saying poor Amazon, can only invest three billion, uh, 5 billion, and Hulu's at about 3 billion, okay? Economy of scale creates a huge heart to copy advantage. That's why it's important for startups to get big. The unique technology I love is personalization. I just gave you an example with Bojack and Stranger Things about how it helps. Network effect, every device in the world is wired to let you stream anytime, anywhere on any device. And then yes, you trust the brand today. It took decades to, to, to build a trusted brand. And the idea that we were trying to deliver on was movie enjoyment made easy. And I hope you find that Netflix delivers on that brand promise. All right, so now we come to the case. I've given you some context. Here's the question, should Netflix enable custom playback speed? And so here's a little bit, okay? Uh, I'm doing like a Stranger Things theme today. But, and here's another Stranger Things thing. But the, here's the question. Should Netflix allow folks to speed up? Maybe you're on a commute and shorter than you want and you're just trying to watch the, the, the episode in that time frame, Or maybe you're watching in a second language and you just want things slowed down a little bit. What, whatever the reason, right? So this is the case, this is the question. And by the way, this is a real time case, okay? So this is an issue that, that Netflix is thinking about and it's, I'm gonna frustrate you because there's no answer and you guys can monitor the site for the next few months to see what happens or doesn't happen. But this is a real issue. So I want you to pretend you're in the room at Netflix trying to figure out what the heck to do. So I'll give you a little bit of consumer insight. The first is this is a highly asked for feature. Customers are saying, hey, I'd love it if I could slow things down or speed it up. That's what they're asking. And, and the reason is th this concept was pioneered both on YouTube, and I am guessing that many of you have, have listened to podcasts probably 20% faster, okay? Um, so this is where the idea is coming from. There's a signal that this might delight folks. So my first question is, should Netflix test this? Now testing means you can test with a subset, you, you know, you don't have to roll it up out to all. And later we'll think about what would the subset be? You know, who, what, or where might it be? So, and, and this is the beauty of Netflix. It's called consumer science. Like there's this let's test it mentality. Let's put it out and see if it works. So my very first question is, should they test this? Um, and there might be some risk in testing it. I, I, I'll let you think about what the risk would be. But I know most of you are leaning against rolling it out. But the question is simpler, which is it's much less scary to do a test of this. Um, anything surprising about this result, your eye? Um, no, I was expecting a strong yes, right? Yeah, 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 so testing is much lower stakes, right? Okay, let's test it, let's see what works. Okay, let's get some data, that's good. Okay, so we went from nobody wanted, or more than half did not wanna roll it out to like almost everybody wants to roll it out here. Cool, okay, so let's get to the next issue. How and where, would you test this? You have the ability to limit it. 
And, and so what are the dimensions on which you'd limit? Oh, that's great. Only in <laughs> Slovakia. <laughs> Only in Australia. Cool. Okay, so you could do country. Give me some other ways of limiting. Okay, only Spanish content. That's a good idea. Uh, do it in a region. Do it randomly. Just put it up to 1%. Only in, okay, good, subsets. Keep going, I wanna see all the ideas. Mm. Opt in, opt in. Share some demographics. Yep. Oh, original content only, that's a very good idea. Um, and and, and I, I, I understand. Okay, 25 to 35 year olds, dog food internally. Oh my God. Yeah, well, the problem with internal is we're all freaks. Like we're not normal people, right? I'm, I'm assuming that everybody on this webinar is not normal. Okay, oh, highest plan members, people are paying the most. I see lots of good ideas, okay? But the point is that you guys all wanna test it and you're thinking about, okay, how might we minimize things? Okay, so we've gotten the answer on that. Now I'm guessing, that many of you were thinking, huh, this is why I'm guessing a lot of you were hanging back. What will the studios think? So let's imagine we do our test in Australia on Netflix original content only, and we, we only do it on mobile devices, whatever, you know, some very limited thing. You're the product manager and you're like, God, I hope the studios don't notice, right? That's what you're thinking. And, and that's what happened, okay? So the reason I know about this is the test was found. And that and the fact that I'm always clearing my cookies and changing browser, you know, I'm, I'm finding all these tests. Okay, so guess what? The studios noticed. So this is Brad Bird. He's the director of The Incredibles, Disney, you know, big dude. Welp, another spectacularly bad idea and another cut to the already bleeding out cinema experience. Why support and finance filmmakers' visions on one hand and then work to destroy the presentations of those films on the other? So this test is discovered, it's found out, and this is Brad's thing. And I love the reply at the bottom. There's a gay on Maine. Her response was, okay, boomer, <laughs> okay? I just love that, like, you old fart. Like, things are changing. So here's another response. Netflix, don't make me call every director and show creator on Earth. To, to fight you, I will win, okay? Um, so they've noticed, and, and the, the response is obvious. This is Aaron Paul, he's on Breaking Bad, or was on Breaking Bad. There's no way Netflix will move forward with this. That would mean they are taking control of others' art and destroying it. So you get a pretty strong sense of what the studio response is already with this tiny limited test, right? Like, oh my God, all heck is breaking loose, okay? All right, so we got that. How would we evaluate if this is a good or bad idea? So let's imagine, I'll put it out there, what metric would you evaluate? So the big dog in Netflix is retention. Like today, like in the old, at startup, 10% canceled every month. You know, when I joined, 5% every canceled every month. Today, 2% canceled every month. It, it retains well. So you're trying to improve retention, but retention is really hard to move. So you need these proxy metrics. So I'm gonna pose a proxy metric, something like this. What if the percentage of customers on a mobile device use this feature at least twice in a month, maybe three times in a month? That would be a measurement of use, if they use it, if they don't use it, then it's not gonna delight them, right? But if they use it two or three times, let's say three times a month, if 20% of customers use it on a mobile device, that might be a pretty strong signal of delight. So let's just imagine you roll it out and you actually see 20% usage on a device that's probably the most relevant to this, which is mobile. And by the way, the mobile usage is high, especially in India where it's mobile only plans that exist today. So let's just imagine that's the result that you get. Lots of usage. And now think about the model. Your job is to delight customers in hard to copy margin enhancing ways. So there's strong signal of delight. If you've got that result, 20%, high likelihood you're gonna delight customers. This is wicked hard to copy. It's magic technology. It, it preserves the lip sync, it makes it sound fine. It's speeding up the blast and bomb scenes a little in a way that nobody can really notice. 
And the idea is actually if it delights customers and if it improves retention just a little bit, you're actually building a better business, right? So this has the potential to delight customers in hard to copy margin enhancing ways, except there's the fear that the studios are gonna go ballistic. So now the same original question, um, with all the data here, would you launch it or not? Wow, it's as fascinating, you're right. Uh, so think about the initial result and whether we've seen a change or not. Yeah, we are seeing some change. I'm gonna also remind everyone uh, while they're voting, um, if you want more seamless experience, double click on the video to enter the full screen and that way you'll, you'll see um, both Gibbs phase and, and the slides and be able to poll. I'm seeing a few comments come up through questions. So I just wanted to mention that. But yeah, look. Actually, if I re remember your I, um, I've given everybody more data. I thought it was 55% no and 45% and yes, and we really haven't changed anybody's mind. You know, okay. right? Okay, uh, now I can say it another way, which is, you know, the, the, the best cases are the ones where you have a division, and, and, and I, I found this, right? Um, so, and, and maybe some people switched, like I have no freaking clue, okay? So, I'm gonna just share with you how I think about this and what I would do. So here's the big question. Should Netflix launch or not launch? And, and like I said, you can find the test sales, but we don't know yet if Netflix is gonna launch or not. And I actually don't know the, the data, um, but if I got those results, if 20% of the customers were using this a few times per month, my thinking is I would launch, okay? So I'm gonna give you a little sense of why. So here's what I'm hoping you'll learn from this. The first, this is about customer obsession. If you, if you find things that, that are delightful to customer, I've sort of learned to double down on that, okay? And, and to ignore other things. And I'll tell you what are the things that I ignore. The second is when I find something that does the, the trifecta, it delights in hard to copy and in margin enhancing ways, again, I lean forward. And there's another concept in Netflix, and this is called tightly aligned and loosely coupled. So this is a product decision. The product team makes this decision. The content team is not in the room. Their job is to find great content that people will love. And they don't need the product team to tell them what that looks like. The product team makes decisions about how to delight customers in hard to copy margin enhancing ways. And in this case, I, you know, it's not important to Netflix that they hear the voice of the studio. Because what I think is going on here is this is just another step in what I call creative destruction. So in the old days, people freaked out when they added sound to movies. And they freaked out when they added color. These are the creators, the storytellers. They freaked out when it all went to 3D art and animation. And we know all these things have made storytelling much better. And this continues. Some of you have probably noticed Bandersnatch by Black Mirror on Netflix. It's the first, one of the first experiments in interactive storytelling. And this is another example of how technology is changing how storytelling works. And in this case, I think that Netflix would just nicely ignore what the studios think. At the end of the day, Netflix is spending 20 billion a year on content. And the storytellers do enjoy working with Netflix because they like having their stories told all around the world. And Netflix gives them a lot of creative freedom. How long should a TV episode be? As long as you want. Can binge watching happen? Sure. You don't have to do all those little summaries of what happened last, et cetera. And so most storytellers really enjoy working with Netflix. So I think Netflix would ignore the issues of the studios. That's my guess. And imagine as a product manager, that would be hard to do. All right, so I'm bringing this home for you right now. So this is common. He's a, he's a rock star too. So I, I just shared with you just a few ideas that I'm hoping that you'll put into play tomorrow when you're doing these kinds of online things. So structure, really disciplined, three chapters, three bullets. Think about the Odyssean story structure. Start with the problem. I was walking along, this bad thing happened. This is what I learned from it. And these are the ideas that you can apply to make your life better. And then the second, engagement. Driving engagement is the key to high quality talks, either whether in person or in a webinar. So work backwards. You know, what's the point I want to land? Tell stories. Share tools, models, and frameworks. And whenever you can, share cases and polling that help show and bring your ideas to life. And the last idea is this creativity. 
It requires time, the urgency, like we got to figure out how to do this well. We need to teach well online, repetition, and then it requires focus. So I, I want to thank you, but I'm not done. So just wait, there's more, but this is the moment, you know, I hope that, you, you, that, that you've enjoyed this, but here's my one more thing, okay? Let's just wait just a minute, because I am a freak. Sometimes I feel like, you know, a street performer doing their thing, and then street performers always make the stupid mistake. They have this huge audience and then they pass the hat and everybody leaves. You know, that's the moment, like I better get out of here before they get my money. They ask for my money. That's really awkward. So I'm at that really awkward moment, but I'm not asking for money. I would love, love, love your feedback. So hold up your phone to the device as though you're taking a picture and a a uh, survey monkey code will magically pop up for you. And it's a net promoter score survey. Zero, socks, tennis, great. Pick any number you want. And I would love, love, love it if you gave me one idea about what was good about today's talk and one idea about what could be better. And this is how I've engaged in that high cadence creativity with a fairly objective metric for how. Now, I recognize that some of you um, are working on an Android where the, uh, you know, it doesn't work. So uh, I, I provided a link for you. So you can go to www.gibsonbiddle.com. I put the link for feedback for, from SurveyMonkey. I put the PDF of the presentation there. It's waiting for you. And I wrote an article of, uh, talking about this stuff on how to give a rock star webinar. So I, again, I would just love, love, love your feedback. That would be amazingly helpful to me. All right, and so at this moment in time, uh, Uri, I'm super happy to answer questions. Um, can you be the voice of the audience for me? Oh, for sure, awesome. We've got a ton, so I'm gonna um, just get rid of this one real quick. Um, and guys, feel free to add more questions. There's um, 15 here, and also upload the questions that you wanna hear Gabe um, take on. So. But let's just start with the most upvoted one here. I think a lot of the folks in the audience, well, also include you and me, are now sort of forced to move online, right? And um, here a person is wondering what has been your biggest learning so far when you shifted towards virtual webinars? Yeah, I'm still learning. Um, yeah, I, I think at the end of the day, it required me to be even more disciplined about everything that I've shared today. and. Mentally, the key insight was when I look out into an audience with in-person people, with real people, um, I can see what's going on. I can tell, you know, if they're checking their phones or whatever. In this context, it took me a while to get in the mindset where I just said, okay, um, actually folks are multitasking. And so uh, the, the, more, the, the more I can work to engage folks in, in, in ways that help tell my stories, make my point, that's even better. And this is when I started um, hacking around with these different tools, you know, these different engagement tactics. Um, Google Slides was super helpful because it created an integrated experience with Slido. Before that, I had to do a lot of sort of wonky task switching. Um, and then if you can't tell, I'm, I'm always nervous about whether the technology will work, right? Um, I mean. I, if I'm on a big stage, like I come in an hour in advance, I look at all the slides in advance, I get mic'd up. I mean, there's just, it's usually the technology that doesn't work. Um, so really just be more disciplined. I'm shorter. I will tell you some things that are confusing to me. I actually have done a talk with Product School. It's called Branding for Builders. It is non-interactive. It's for 40 minutes. It's sort of, you know, in your face with the slides there. People actually think it's live, but it's a recording. And that's been among my highest NPS experiences, okay? And then I've had experience like this called Hacking Your Product Leader Career, where it starts, it started up in the 80, you know, when, when 350 people watched it live, they could do the engagement via Slido, but then they watched the recorder when they couldn't interact, and the NPS dropped down to like 72. By the way, I share the, you know, that video and those NPS survey results in that article I wrote on Medium about doing this. And so I guess the mega question is I'm still learning, right? I think we all are. Um, yeah. We're going to interrupt you for a quick technical. Now, Gib, would you mind if you actually stop sharing your slides? Because I think uh, people enjoy 
our yeah. faces uh, more now in full screen. They can still see the questions. Okay, um, did I just do what you wanted? No, that's all good. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, good, good. Um, yeah. So the next question here is actually, and you started talking about this perhaps, but what needs to change regarding, you know, the content of my presentation when I'm moving to a virtual setting? Yeah, so recognize for me, I have started with in-person presentations. That, that's really how I worked out the content. And then I've moved into a virtual setting. Um, yeah, I, I guess, I mean, you're, you're aware of some of these experiments. I actually experimented with Slido in an in-person audience, but um, I stopped doing it because it slows things down a little bit. Um, and, you know, hands are better. You know, should you launch to all or not? right? Hands are just faster. And an interesting thing about presentations is if your job is to communicate passion, sometimes pace, like I, I've learned to move a little bit faster than, than, than would be natural because pace inspires energy, energy communicates passion and passion is what, you know, gives your ideas more oomph, if you will. Yeah. Um, did I answer the question? Well, we can only hope, but I would, I would add one point. I think now yeah. that we're moving to, to virtual, and I think many of us are realizing how important that engagement or interaction is, right? You're just stuck behind your screen. So adding, um, whether it's something enabled by tech, like the polling that you've done or, or um, you, your random screams to wake everyone listening, I think that's very important to, to edit. No, you don't do random screams, <laughs> purposeful screams. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we've got a, um, this is a quick question, I suppose. So video, how important is that for a presenter uh, to be on video for during a webinar? I don't know yet. So I, I have a data point, which is I've put a whole course on Teachable. And for that, I used um, Loom. And so with Loom, you know, I use my slide deck and then it's, it's me. I record it with a little talking head and a circle. It doesn't look too bad. Um, but I don't know the answer to this yet. You know, my intuition, if, if you look at that branding for builders that product school published, I mean, it's got like 10,000 viewers. The NPS is at like 72, 73 for context. 50 is considered very good, 70 is world-class. If you get an 80, I just call that dancing on rooftops. <laughs> um, anyways, that one, it's kind of one third me and two third slides. I, for me, I obviously, you know, I, I, I am, mo like I really am passionate about this stuff. And so it's sort of better, and you can tell even if I know it's a small screen, I'm trying to communicate with my hands, even within Loom. So I don't know. My intuition is that um, people want to get to know the speaker um, and they want to create a relationship with the speaker. So the speaker needs to be on screen. That's my intuition. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. There's a question from Mike here. Um, so any technical pains that you experience when setting up or leading webinars? Yes, many. <laughs> um, so, you know, the first one, here's my biggest challenge. Webinars on Zoom, and by the way, I wrote about all this stuff. Um, they're hard to practice, right? So the first thing is have a good co-host, okay? So your eyes, my good co-host. He's making sure all the tools and technology work. He's the voice of the audience. He gives me a break. But you want to not have to worry as much as you can about the technology so you can focus on the content, okay? Um, so that's the co-host job. Um, Unfortunately, you know, before the last month, I would only do maybe two or three webinars a month. You know, now I can do two or three a week. And that's how you practice. Um, and practicing, so that's the real, the biggest challenge. How do you spin up an audience to practice? Your eye and I, we did practice this two days before. Uh, you know, I put it up on Twitter and LinkedIn, like I need guinea pigs. I need people to, to test drive. It was really to make sure that the integration of all this worked. And they gave me great feedback. Um, so this is the second time I've done this. Um, what else? Oh, the biggest frustration for me, I work in Keynote. I love Keynote on the Mac. To get to Google Slides, I have to do a transition from Keynote on Mac to PowerPoint on Mac, and then I upload PowerPoint into Google Slides, and then I there I transition it to Google Slides, and then finally I have to Google Slides. 
I need Google Slides because it needs to be in the cloud to do the integration with uh, Slido. So if there's a Google friend out there, I'd, I'd love to meet you because I think they're, the biggest challenge for me is there's a limit on how big a file you can transition when you upload a PowerPoint. I think it's about 30 meg. I use lots of big images. Some of my presentations are like 500 meg, so I have to block everything into bite-sized chews. Anyways, so that's at the moment my biggest frustration. And then the anxiety, will the stuff work? Like today, I am in my home. Um, I, I intended to go to a friend's office with very reliable internet. Um, luckily, my home's working today, right? That's scary, okay. Awesome. Um, there's two questions from Angela, which I'll try and combine actually, because it sounds like Angela is perhaps preparing some presenters to, you know, present virtually, and she's asking what should um, she or they include in in the tip, say like a spreadsheet, a tip sheet for presenters, and also any common mistakes that they should avoid. So what would be your like top three tips for presenters? Yeah. So um, I wrote about this in, in the, on my www.gibsonbiddle.com. There's a link to my Medium article on all this. Um, honestly, you know, if you, if you got what I focused on here, it's all about structure, engagement, and then experimentation. Um, so that's, I'd say about 80% of what you do is everything you learn in an in-person audience matters even more with a webinar audience. Um, so then in the deltas, um, my biggest things, it's uh, because of the technology, you're, you, you have to practice uh, more than you normally would. That's probably the first thing. And that means you need those test drive audiences, which you can find, they're called friends and family, Twitter, LinkedIn, whatever. And then my third is um, you probably have to experiment more. Um, you can tell I have a fundamental question, which is uh, I've had a high N I've had high NPS with a basically a recording, and I've had a high NPS where I use all the tool tech tool and tactics I'm using now. Like, huh? Okay, what's the right answer? And I think that you know each of those had a different audience and different content. So this is where I'm still very much in the learning process. Yeah. Quick By the way, there's a lot of business questions too. Like I, I figured out how the business works of big stage talks. Like, okay, how does the business work with online talks or online workshops, et cetera? I'm like, I don't know yet. <laughs> I mean, now, now that you brought it up, there's a few questions on like, how do I drive attendees to my webinar? How do I perhaps monetize that? Any early thoughts on that? Yeah, this is, I mean, unfortunately, because I didn't care, a lot of speakers, the normal path is they write a book and then they they get the emails. Like um, Near Eyal is a friend of mine. He he wrote this, he wrote a uh, hooked and then indistractable. Um, he said to me, "Give treat email addresses like dollar bills," <laughs> and I ignored him. I mean, you can tell I sort of approached this with attitude. I'm not collecting emails. I don't advertise. So. You know, he was probably right, but for a variety of reasons, I didn't care that much. Um, so the short answer is, it's all about your partners. So, you know, at the end of the day, your eye brought in, look like 120 peeps today. Um, you know, and this, this is actually, if you think about it, kind of niche audience. You know, my intent was there's an audience out there that's just trying to do what I'm doing tomorrow. Um, I work with all of the conference organizers have live in-person events and they're all like spinning quickly because they have to get to this. Um, so yesterday, Product Collective, which is industry, you know, they, they sent out an email to 30,000 people talking about, you know, my online workshops in, in April. Mm -hmm. um, so I, for me, and these are partnerships I've created over the last two or three years. I, I've, I've talked at all these major conferences. I've done in-person workshops at all these conferences. So now, you know, we're all partnering together. Um, you know, they, they take care of the eyeballs um, and I'm focused on the content. And, you know, and, and I'm mainly inspired by teaching. That's really what I'm trying to do now. Hmm. Now, what do you expect these virtual events to look like in the future? There's a question here as well with a little upvotes. Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a really good question. So 
I just like, again, I'm scratching my head. Product school, you know, my little videos included in that, they, they get about 10,000 views for their virtual conference. Like it's a big number. And, and I, I have to know in advance that it's happening so I can get all those links up on my little website. Um, but I'm overwhelmed by how much folks like that linear video experience. And frankly, they, they actually think it's live. Okay. Which is okay. Cool. Um, so that's one, which is just focus on great content delivered well and the tools and technology that, 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 that people can carve out three or four hours for content that they, that they really want to watch. In that case, it's product leaders. Um, and, and they're happy to do it and they don't have to travel and they don't have to pay money. You know, there's a lot of good about making the transition. And then the other model is you, you try to make it a, a more engaging, more interactive experience, which is what I've been experimenting with. Um, so I'm a host of the Product Leader Summit in September. You know, I, I'm hopeful it'll be in person, um, but I'm, I'm already experimenting. What would that be? What I tend to do, I, I tend to focus on exec level experiences where I'm trying to create an environment where it's like you're all in the same room. So I'll talk to 50 people, but then I'll drop them into Zoom rooms where they're working together, usually on shared Google Slides. And, you know, because for me, in that context with executives, I'm trying to help these product leaders to get to know each other. Because most of your learning in your career is from your peers. It's not from like talking heads like me, okay? Um, so two radically different hypotheses, linear video, excellent content, tools and technology work versus highly interactive, engaging experience that are custom crafted to, to probably a smaller audience. And those are the two hypotheses I'm following right now. Awesome. All right. I think this is going to be our last question. Um, how do you keep the energy high when you don't see the audience? Any tips on that? <laughs> uh, truthfully, um, not very hard for me. Like <laughs> I, I took a year off from college, uh, like, I don't know, 35 years ago, 30, whatever, eight years ago. And, um, I just, I started a sailing school of all things. I just love creating content and presenting and teaching. And then I just, I realized that teaching, unfortunately it's not a well-paid career. So I did a lot of stuff that pays better. And then I've been back to teaching in the last five years. Um, so I'm just so inspired by that. Uh, that's how I keep the energy up. And then I, I wanna do a good job, <laughs> right? <laughs> and energy and pace and passion, you know, create better work. And then to know me, you know, I, I have an NPS result for everything. And, you know, I, I'm, if I don't get to 50, I'm totally bummed. So that's inspiring me to try to do a good job every time I do it. That's really what's going on. Yeah. Awesome. I love that. Well, thank you so much for your time, Gabe. There's a lot of questions about slides and recording being available. So yes, we'll send both slides and recording. Slides are already up on your website. Um, we'll send the recording in a follow-up email. There's a few questions about Slido. Um, I don't want to make this a sales pitch. So if you have any questions, again, you can also send a follow up so you can just respond to that email or email us at support at slido.com. There's a ton of resources on slido.com from our side. Um, and yeah, Gip, thank you so much. Stay safe out there in California. Yeah, my, so my shout outs. Um, thanks, Pete. I bet you're out there. Thanks, Martin. Thanks a ton, Uri. Um, and John Beckman, I hope you're watching from Zoom because I, I need to find some Zoom. <laughs> And if you're on Google Slides, I really need friends at Google Slides as well. <laughs> um, and then, yes, www.gibsonbiddle.com. Nothing bad will happen. Slides are waiting for you. If the survey thing didn't work, you can do it there. And then an article I wrote um, about how to do this. So enjoy. And thanks so much for having me today, Uri. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks, everyone.